Okay, morning everybody. So I'm very glad this got problem got addressed at the first time. So we're gonna do today is first go through the homeworks. So everybody I'll pass down the homeworks and go through it. And we're gonna discuss about the answers for all the questions today. Okay? And I, I also posted the question for the other part, but I don't think I forgot to mention it in the class. Everybody see the canvas? Yes. There's a second homework due this Thursday. Yes, we're struggling with that. Say that? We're struggling with that. <laughs> okay, no problem. So take a look at these homeworks, and we have one last homework. And I looked at the calendar. It looks like the best time for us to have the exam is on the October 5th roughly two weeks from now. And uh, that will give us the time to go through two more homeworks and finish some of the rest of the lecture relevant to um, chain confirmation. There's a little bit of thing left I'll cover um, today and I'll discuss um, in the, another occasion in the last lecture, okay? So here's your homework. Um, let me make sure. I got one homework has no name, so I'll leave it here. Let's see this one. We got Evan Stacy right there. Evan. Yeah, put put a good job. Thank you. Let me give this to Andrew Bates. Here you go. Yeah, pretty good job. Um, Andrew? Yeah. Good job. No, no, I don't think it's yours. You did a good job. Chantel, here are yours. Yours. Uh. Trey? Did I say it right, Trey? Oh, here you go. <laughs> uh, this one only has the family. Your Let me make sure I got that. Jeff, right? I only have the family written there. Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> Nick? Yeah. Then we have Kristen. Did I say that? Yeah, Kristen. Here you go. Kristen. Anthony, here you go. Penelope. Okay. Uh, James here. Here you go. I I have some of you send me by email. I already respond to you, so you should have it right. I think this is a Nolan Bears. Let's see if my guess is right. Someone know his handwriting? Yes. <laughs> it's it's yours? Yes, it's my handwriting. Okay. Perfect. All right. So we got everybody's work back. Um let's go through that first then we're going to talk a little bit lecture. So I felt there is some ambiguity in the question one. So let me explain what the ambiguity. I think that ambiguity or confusion is likely coming from the bending ring, right? So how do we count how many bonds there and how do we treat it? Um, I don't think there's anything wrong if you treat it as three bonds versus the two bonds. For me, it's just a, a minor detail, but conceptually, I think most of you get how 
what this question is asking and how to get there. Um, I'll talk about both cases. In, in either way, um, let's get a pen. In either way, so this question is basically help us to visualize what would be a PET. Is it flexible or not? And I think the, let me keep this, right this, let me unplug and hopefully I can get this guy back on again so not too distracting. Oh, it's in the back, right? Let's raid this up just for a second. After we finish the homework, we're going to lower it again. So the, the question is relevant to um, PET material. So what we were asking is, how do we understand the PET? And I think th this basic question is a, a question we likely to give in the exam because this is a very fundamental. It's asking you guys how to relate this measure the molecular weight information to chain flexibility. And this covers <laughs> persistence, lens, and um, um, statistical chain lens, etc. So we need to know the molecular structure and what's the bond lens in this. So those parameters, some of them are known, some of them you can look at in the internet. So these values are given in the structure in PET. You got CH2, CH2 bonds. So first, let's count a little bit how many bonds in the backbone. So that's, I think, where most of the confusion is. So here, we have half bonds, right? That's very clear because this is shared by another molecular. You have one, two, three, four. Five. Okay, here are some of you count six, seven, eight. No problem at all. But uh, more accurately, because this is a giant bonds, so a lot of time let's consider it slightly differently. And you have two, two more here. So the question is where this part will be counted, right? So if we don't count that, that's, this is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven is what we know, but how about here? Some of you answered to be 10 bonds, that's fine. I think that's reasonable. Um, you can, could get average bond length equals to one tenth of number of bonds, etc. You just need to count every single bond. I won't write every single detail, but you should reach about 1.44 in one case. The, that would be what I'm approaching. So if you use this value, you will be able to reach um, C infinity. I'll just first to show you guys the answer, then show you how to get there, okay? And LP. So the textbook also has a solution. And in the solution, I think it's suggested a slightly different version compared to what many of you go through this route. So I think this is no problem for me. I can see the value of doing that. And you guys understand all the concept of LP, C, infinity, et cetera. But in the, in the homework solution, it basically thinks this should be equivalent to be two bonds. And the bond, because it's hexagonal, the length of this was given by equivalent of two carbon-carbon bonds. So in the homework solution given by the textbook writer, they claim L will be one ninth. Oh, three multiplied by one point So 
So this is roughly 1.5 Enstrom. So not too much difference. This will result you have slightly different answer in the final value, but we don't expect the average bond lens to be too far away from what individual bond, right? So either way, I'll give you full credit for the homework. For me, there's no difference. It's just a minor glitch. And in the final test, we won't give you any ambiguity. We're only going to give you linear chains, so don't worry about the bending ring. Now go, come back. Let's assume one way or other. Let's assume the, uh, use this value. And how do we get the final value? Let's discuss a little bit more. We were given a monomer, we were given a h square, which is end to end distance. And this, as we know, we talked many times in the class, this will be equals to end to end distance average will be c infinity and l square divided by, this is a given by 0 0.9 and strong moles per gram. So this is uh, how people actually commonly measure in the lab scale, because this is a value you can measure. And molecular weight is something you can change. So as I explained, you can throw in different molecular weight and measure it by DSC. And this uh, DLS, or light scattering, static, either scale or dynamic. So you can get this is basically a slope of that. Okay? So using this, you can calculate rigidity, et cetera. So this is how people do it. But how do we go from this value? If we know the L, we can calculate C infinity if we can get this value. N is unknown, M is unknown, but combined, it, this value is known because this is basically defined as number of bonds and um, N is the total molecular weight. You can link these two using a monomer molecular weight, N O, okay? Right? Everybody following this part? So your total molecular weight will be given by this, there's N repeating unit. N repeating unit multiplied by monomer repeating unit will be N total we can call it total molecular weight of your polymer. So if you move the n value here, this n zero is basically links these two values. So you can replace this with um, nine. Let's me right here. So this can be simplified as nine. Oh, oh by the way, this should be n not the n, right? Because this is a repeating unit. This will be equals to nine times bonds of um, how many individual bonds. As we talk about, this will be equivalent to two carbon-carbon bonds, so that's where the value nine is. Yeah? Sure. Um, this m, yeah. So this part? Yeah, because I think i sorry. So let me, let me go turn this direction because I wasn't enough consideration for the student on the other side. So N0, let's, let's write from the top so everybody can see. So total molecular weight will be equals to repeating molecular weight in terms of units as a monomer unit molecular weight. So let's say I should update this one. N is repeating unit, right? So if your molecular repeating unit is 10, that means 10 times this uh, monomer molecular weight, which is also now, it's about 192. You can get what is N, N, or sometimes we can just uh, call here N total, the total molecular weight of your molecular, right? That makes sense to everybody? So, however, we need to translate into N to n. That's where it's relevant here. Not hard. We just need to count how many bonds in this particular case. 
we have nine individual bonds. Uh, this is equivalent bonds, by the way. I would put a quotation mark. So if we apply every single result there, so C infinity NL divide by N can be translated to C infinity L square and N zero. So by the way, this is 192. Got it? So here you can get, that's one way to solve the problem. The other way, which I sometimes teach the student and most simple is just to give a molecular way into your polymer and this will actually eventually cancel out for N, NL and X, uh, bond, etc. So how do we do that? If you assume a molecular weight to the polymer, you can use this particular relationship. Let's assume that the second way, sometimes the easier to understand is, if you assume a molecular weight to be a random number, 10K, it doesn't matter. So you can use this H square will be equals to 10K or 10,000 multiplied by this value, 0 0.9 you could get a value of end-to-end -end distance, right? H. So in this case, you could be able to get what the value of bonds, N would be equals to 10K divided by repeating unit, 192, and multiply by nine. You would get number of bonds. So then you can use C infinity equals to NL square versus H square as shown here. Okay, this method will give you exactly the same results. It's just uh, you use a given molecular weight to help you visualize what the, each individual value. But they are exactly the same. So if you got this one right, you got the characteristic ratio, and you know if you use the other one, you think about is 10 bonds, use shorter lengths, this value will be off slightly, somewhere between eight to 10 I see in the home answer, but that's fine. This capture is very close to what we want to talk about in the essence of it. And B um, will be equals to MBL is equivalent statistical bond. This is repeating unit. N will be C infinity NL square, right? We know what these individual values are. We can calculate what N value is or, or what B value is. So. If you do it correctly, B equals to C infinity N divided by N. Let me move away so everybody can look at the data. Okay? B is statistical average value. Can you see it? Okay. On LP persistence lens, the last one will be half characteristic ratio with static scope bond lens. So you should be able to reach the statistical range is six, six point angstrom. That means this is about four or five times, about, about 4.5 times L0. So it takes four and five bonds to bend the backbone out of 90 degree roughly. So that means the polymer is fairly flexible, okay? for the PET molecular. So um, in the homework, we won't, in, the, in the test, we won't talk about this PET, but likely more straightforward molecular structures. Ask you guys to demonstrate your knowledge about correlation between all these basic concepts, persistence, lens, etc. Okay, so any question for this particular one? I think this one is everybody had the most problem. The second one, ask, explain why um, poorly isoprene um, is, is different than the other molecular, than the polystyrene. So uh, we cannot compare a statistical lens because B doesn't represent flexibility. The 
the, the value talks about flexibility is LP. And we should compare either characteristic ratio or LP. And if you compare those two, the polyisoprene <coughs> is just much, much softer compared to the other one. And the other reason why the B appears to be similar is just because in polyisoprene, in each repeating unit, you have four bonds, four carbon-carbon bonds compared to the other case. So the B value will be apparent to be increased just because B value, consider how many number of bonds in each repeating unit in between the bracket. The longer the molecule like PET, the B value will be even bigger. If you have repeating unit has 30, 40 bonds, B value will continue to increase, but not the case for persistence lengths, okay? So this is more or less like, just to want to know how you're understanding between those two concepts. I think most of you got this one right. Um, last but not least, ask about, so in free joint chain model, in block polymer, uh, in statistical polymer, there is there any difference? So as we discussed in the lecture, um, in the free joint chain model, if you apply the equation, that we will get into the self turn and the cross turn again. And in that case, all the self turn will stay and all the cross turn will go away. So eventually, you ended up just need to count how many bonds and how bonds in each lens. It doesn't matter in free joint chain where they are located within the bond. So in other words, the O3 should give you the same results. It will be equal to number of bonds, bond length square, add them all of them together. Okay? And uh, any question for this part? Okay. I think for this one, only one or two of you had some problem with this, but the most of you got the certain one correct. The confusion is mostly coming from the first one. How do we de define the bending ring? And as long as you can demonstrate your understanding, nine bond and ten bond for me, it doesn't make uh, too much of a difference, okay? But you can, some of you showed the value of persistence length is really low, and bond length is off by order of magnitude, then you need to be careful, right? So bond length will be harder to be, uh, let's say if your calculate result is one nanometer, that means 10 times bigger than normal bond, you know that's a problem. Um, it doesn't make sense. Or characteristic ratio is less than one, you know that's a problem. That's against the definition of what the characteristic ratio. So, So in the last lecture, we actually had some projector issue, and we haven't finished all the discussion about this part. So in here, we're going to revisit quickly what we talked about in the last lecture about um, persistence lens and radius of gyration. In the radius of gyration, we talk about how RG can be defined by Mass of the body versus the momentum of inertia. And momentum of inertia is defined by mass multiplied by uh, radius to the center square. Okay? Everybody following this part? So we talked a little bit about how RG can be related, related to the bond, because if we show here, 
every R A and R J is relevant to the center of uh, one of the carbon to the center imaginary mass center. So this defines as um, radius gyration R I, which is here. So how heavy your element and how far away from a mass center defines what the radius of gyration. And there's a simple relationship that we can apply the mass between what is A, B, and the angle of the bond between here to create what is C. C is basically, if we consider this A, B, C, so we can link R, I, R, I minus 1 with basically L, I, which is now relevant to the bond. So we can link the R, G to the bond. So let's see if we have enough time. If we have, then I'll talk a little bit more about how we can link this. This is basically a simple way to describe. RG is basically, from that simple relationship, you can reach to RG square will be equals to 1 divided by 2N square. And sum of RIJ, I equals 1 to N, J equals 1 to N. And if you recall, this part is very similar to what is end-to-end um, -end distance, right? So Rij can be defined as the bond distance I and J. This is a means vector uh, from one Ri to the Rj, okay? Can be easily relevant to absolute value, the distance between these two atoms we are calling the B square. So if you apply this to there, we can reach out. If you do a Taylor expansion to here, we can reach basically RG square is relevant to end-to-end -end distance square divided by 6 for the polymer, right? So the reason, again, why people need RG is we can do a light scattering now to measure RG and to measure end-to-end -end distance. I mentioned a couple of times this is the challenge because you can't pull two chain in to measure it. And now we have a light scattering tool. You can measure radius of gyration. Uh, again, I mentioned that this is a, some mathematic involved. I'll talk, I'll talk an offline video, I'll upload and put it into the uh, canvas. So if you're interested in mass, how we link this process, from RI to the bond lens, you're welcome to watch it. It's likely going to be 20, 30 minutes, but it's optional only if you are very into the mass. Otherwise, I gave a, a field class many years before. I found some students uh, challenging follow, a very feel very challenging follow the mass, and uh, that's lost the point of this class because I want to teach everybody the concept, not necessarily the boring mass. So, we talked about radius gyration in Gaussian coil. So again, this R square will be equals to um, MBL divided by 6. So end-to-end -end distance versus the Gaussian coil, this is going to be a difference. We listed other values, so you just need to know. And I just strongly discourage you memorize them. So radius gyration can be also applied to Gaussian star. That means not just a linear polymer. If you have a star polymer, you can give different arms, so you can link to a uh, number of arms. That means how many arms are hanging out. If you have a polymer that has five star, you can apply number five here. And see, this is a normalization factor. This will, if you take this away, this is the same as what we described in the Gaussian coil. And this will be how long each arm is and the uh, number of statistical lengths B divided by six, so this is exactly RG of individual arm and relevant to the center of the arm. Um, Gaussian ring, this is interesting. Instead of a linear polymer, if we make a loop, the RG will be smaller by a factor of one divided by root square two. So if you connect the end of the polymer together, your polymer coil will occupy less space. Maybe this year we should have used this as a homework or test. I'll ask you why this is the case. Maybe. Solid sphere we talked about in last class. If you have not a radius, uniform radius, if you have ellipsoidal, that means you have difference in different, uh, or in different direction. This also applies. 
it's average if you know if you can R1, R2, R3 is equal, it simplifies to a solid sphere. I think we did the homework on the thin rods. That would be interesting. So if you have a rod lens L, um, you can reach out to the radius of gyration will be equals to square. RG square will be one L squared divided by 12. I believe one of the homework is relevant to calculate RG. So I'll save this for the homework session. So when we explain the homework, we can do one of the RG together on the board. And some of the tests we might give is understanding RG instead of in this thing, rod, the uniform density. We ask about if the density is different, what would be the impact? Cylinder and the thin disk, they, they all have their unique radius gyration. But commonly, in what sense everybody uses RG? Um, when you graduate, I want to talk about practice, practical usage. I think you don't need to memorize any equation because you're not going to use it. But realistically, you need use RG to when you measure the polymer coil size. So you run GPC, et cetera. You need to know how the RG relevant to the polymer size. And in the next lecture, when we talk about polymer solution, it's actually critical. Why RG is critical? Because RG is relevant to the polymer coil size, right? Think about RG is roughly a little bit smaller than space I occupy, but to tell you the dimension of your, your molecular. So now, if your boss asks you to formulate an ink, um, the cons you know, one of the unique property of polymer solution is when polymer is dilute, the viscosity dependence on molecular weight goes linearly by a factor of one. But once it's entered entanglement phase or concentrated case, the viscosity scales very differently with molecular weight and high, much higher dependence on. So it's good to know, let's say RG can tell you what the coil size and when the coil star will start to touch each other and start to enter concentrated phase, right? So that's something practical use of the RG. And we will cover a little bit more in, the, uh, in October lecture when we talk about polymer solutions and talks about Fourier Huggins theory, et cetera, OK? However, um, from time to time, people do like to give quizzes or questions. Given a molecular weight, given a characteristic ratio, what is RG? You can actually calculate what the RG, right? It's not that hard because RG is related to end-to-end -end distance. You know the char characteristic ratio or statistical bond lens. You can, based on molecular weight, do an exercise like what we did there. Then you can get what is end-to-end -end distance. You can relate end-to-end -end distance to RG by a simple equation, a scale of root square 6. Okay, Because this is square. So there, RG and end-to-end uh, -end distance scales by 1 divided by root square six, okay? Um, so that describes RG. So um, we're gonna chat one more thing that is unique to the lecture. I'll try to cover half of it and maybe cover all of it. Let's see how the time goes. So everything we talk to now, we always describe chain statistic as average. Remember, every time we put a bracket in end to end distance, we never talk about individual chain. But also, it's important to think about what happens in individual chain, right? So, um, some property requires average because it's more representative for the class. Let's say we need to know average height or average weight for the class that's more representative. But sometimes, some property like we measure, let's say you have a microscope or super resolution camera, we take a picture of this class, then it's no longer average. It's just a time snap of what's happening in, in that particular time frame. And even crazier, you can imagine if we somehow has a camera, has the ability to zoom in to, to just me, then looking at just one individual, then you are looking at individual chain. Right? Not instead of everybody. So 
an equally important question is, um, what is everybody's understanding on a single chain? Not averaged, just a single chain? That is useful in many ways, as you can imagine. Uh, a classic example that I'm going to talk about uh, relevant to this is single chain confirmation has one practical use that almost everybody use it every day in your life is um, relevant to the rubbery material. I, I'm going to discuss more detail in the, in the November when we talk about rubber elasticity, but a very simple understanding and relevant to you is, think about um, some of you have the mask, has the rubber bands in the, in the back, so it's when you pull it, it's extend, when you release, it's retract. So why that's the case? We can answer with everything we learned from this particular month and something in the November. It's called entropy elasticity. So think about a polymer coil. We talked about that, right? So it need adopt a certain conformation. And the conformation, as we talked about, like a Gaussian coil, so it's randomly as a coil. But it fluctuates, right? At one time, it may adopt this. The other times, maybe go in this direction. So everything we talk about is statistical average of what the all conformation combine. However, it is possible you can just look at one single chain and understand its conformation. So that refers to probability. And we will chat a little bit about probability today, how we understand if you just uh, has a super, super cool camera that can resolve in the visual chain. Your polymer coil is dis dissolved in a solution. On average, they have RG. But what if I have a camera so nice, I can zoom in, and I can freeze the chain motion. I can measure a single chain. What do you think it will look like? What's the probability of you find the chain conformation to be equal to RG, to be smaller, to be larger? They're all probable, right? So if my RG is half of my size, so if I take a picture of myself, if I'm doing this, I'm smaller than average size, but if I'm doing this, I will be bigger. So same for polymer coil. Individually at a given time, they can adopt conformation fully extended. That's possible. But chances is low. It's not always you're going to find every single chain is fully extended, but there's a couple of chain out of billion might adopt a more extended version. But next time you take it, it will might relax. So it's, it's going through a dynamic motion. Like everybody, if we're a living <coughs> human being, we're walking around, we change conformation all the time. Same for molecule. So how do we understand single chain? So there's a couple ways we can understand what happens into the single chain, not the average property. And single chain confirmation, as I mentioned to you, will be very important to understand rubber elasticity. A very simple example is if you think about a polymer chain, now you have a tweezer. You can pull one end of the polymer chain, the other end. It's a Gaussian coil, right? But you know, imagine your entment. You can start to pull in the chain. It's possible, right? We can pull all the way to end-to-end -end distance. Sorry, a contour length, not an end-to-end distance. That's the longest you can. That's possible, imaginary, right? However, this confirmation, is it idealized? Uh, no, because we know average confirmation time will be adopted Gaussian core. So if you let it go, it's going to come back. And there is a good reason it wants to come back to the Gaussian core. It's called um, entropy driven because the entropy in the, in the um, core state is much bigger than your stretch states. We're going to come back to more detail in the next lecture. But you can imagine there is stretching force happening there. And that is rubber elasticity relevant to the single chain conformation. So, <coughs> I'm going to ask everybody a question. So now, <laughs> bless you, if we have three dimensional space, we go by x, y, z, 
Um, in the, all the previous work, we talked about RG, right? But now, if I have a single chain, I pin one of the chain end to the origin of it where it is. It will adopt again a Gaussian chain, but it will always have a chain end. We know this is end to end distance REE vector, right? So what we have learned so far is average REE vector will be zero. Every IE square vector will be NL square for free joint chain. All right? That's what we talked about so far. Remember, there's average. So what about REE? Non-average, non-square. So that's something we need to talk about is probability. Why? Because if you look at one coil, it might be here. The other coil, it might be end up using a different color. I'm not going to draw everything again. Maybe the other dots will be here. The third one might be here. I have one last color. Maybe let's put it here. OK, so it's all possible, right? This is a larger end-to-end -end distance. The question is, What's the chance to find IE? So I'll, I'll tell you the answer first, then explain how to interpret it. So end to end distance has been shown to be highly dependent on the length. The probability is actually going roughly this way. It's a distribution. This is a plot as r. And this r is, is just a, a distance, OK? And this is a probability. And we're going to go through what the probability is just in a second. Basically, it says chance. What's the chance that you're finding it? So a very short distance, if the end-to-end -end happened to be lied in its origin, Possible, but unlikely. In real chain, it's impossible because of excluding one. But it's, if it's a free joint chain, the end, if you walk around, move around, it is possible to hit here. Fairly low. How about at the distance r to the center? Slightly high. And it will tap off when it's very far away. Right? That's a probability issue than average. So that's why, think about the classroom. There's distribution in students' height. Some of the students might be a little bit shorter than the other. So in representative, we always need to take average. And this is REE square. is most probable representative in this. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more detail how these all values are relative to each other, but give you the concept of what why we need to care about probability? Because this is the chance we go from averaged to individual. And sometimes we like individual rhythm, right? I like Marvel superheroes. I like superhero. I, ha I like this guy to be the toughest, strongest, most powerful polymer core I'll ever have. It may not represent to every single human on the planet, but I just love watching this guy put on good show. Could it be Captain America, or this could it be Iron Man. I don't know you guys' preference, but I think this is Iron Man, my favorite. Um, so let's talk about probability, polymer physics. So in here, now, how do we get the probability? I think in the, let, let's go through this slide. This is a little bit easier to understand. So that's the answer. The probability of finding a chain at distance r, r is basically the distance from here to the center. And what is the chance of you finding a, finding a chain? OK, this is probability end to end distance. This is probability of finding a chain. They're different, OK? 
Finding a chain is more relevant to what we are doing. This is the, the end to end distance is given by, if you look at it here, mb squared is basically end to end distance, correct? End to end distance. So this is a constant, 3 divided by 2 pi is a constant. And power of 2, 3 looks like complex, but you can think about all these are constant. And if we know this is a constant, the only reason it exists here is a normalization factor. So that when we integrate all the probability at different r, this will be equal to 1. Even if we take it away, it won't affect the distribution shape. This only raises this up and down, but didn't expand in this direction. Um, this is more important. E exponent exp. Minus sign is important. Don't miss this minus sign. Sometimes when I give a lecture, right on the board, I miss minus sign. Minus sign is important because it's, it gives you correct distribution value dependence of r. Two thirds again, same as here, mb squared r squared. This is n to n distance. This is r squared. r here represents distance to the center. Okay. So let's think about if the r goes up, the probability of finding the chain is going to increase then drop. This is the function described here. Okay. So using this equation, you can understand the probability of finding a chain size at a given dimension. If you take average of this, this will, the beauty of this equation is to give you exactly what we found in NL square. Okay, they are linked. If you take average, it will be exactly that. But if you want to take individual, just one chain, you can describe by that in terms of probability. Um, So how do we understand the probability a little bit more? I wrote a short note the other day. I thought it would be easy to explain it. So this is, again, 1D random walk. We kind of introduced a little bit at the beginning of class. You take a couple moves, what the chances of you finding it? It can be normalized by um, this is basically the probability Pn, distribution with x. One step, you have. 50-50 chance to take plus 1, minus 1. Two step, you have minus 2, 0, and that's a probability. Three step, that's where it is. So your probability of finding a chain n can be give, basically given by this particular equation. Um, if your chance at 0 after taking four step is possible to be, um, to be given by this particular equation. If you plot that basically out, it's this. You have a high chance to finish at zero, but it tapers out. Okay? In the real chain, it's slightly different. We go from the random walk to self avoid work. So the original position will be cut off because you can go back to original position. But overall shape of distribution doesn't change. There's also a high distribution than this. In the long distance, this distribution chance will go down. In other words, if I use my fancy camera to look at polymer solution, it's similar like throw a dice and find what the end-to-end -end distance is. This means high chance at there, lower chance at there. Okay. Okay. So, any question for particular this? This part, we will come back to the later relevant to this particular relationship and equation using probability of finding a chain. Everybody follow this part? Any question? Okay, good. Good. So, um, I think that will be uh, roughly the the. Maybe I'll, I'll explain one more slide too. This is again my handwriting. It's a little bit, it's, it's a good way to explain what is rubber elasticity is. So 
the what is entropy? Entropy relates to different states of your structure, right? So high entropy means this is a highly disordered. Low entropy means it's highly ordered. For example, a polymer crystal is an example of low entropy. A random distributed polymer is high entropy. Um, or in this room, if I have a, a, a stack of book, if I stack very cleanly, it will be order low entropy states. So different conformation is basically what it means. So in the Gaussian chain, you have a low entropy, a high entropy, sorry, high entropy. If you pull it, your entropy will drop because the straighter you pull it, it's more order. It's less conformation can adopt. If you pull it perfect straight, it's always can stuck in that state. There is no second state that can pick. But if you let it relax in the Gaussian coil, you know, you can go this way, that way. As long as the end-to-end -end distance is the same, there's different ways you can achieve that. So entropy is, in this particular case, is high. Entropy is given by Boltzmann constant, ln. This means, symbol means, omega means number of possible states. So if you have a lot of conformation states, that means it's a high um, entropy state, so which is there. And the entropy of the system is given by kT equals to r squared by mv squared. So this is very similar to the exponent term we talked about in, in rubbery, uh, in, in the material and the uh, possible configuration states. So when the r increases, your rubber has less states. That's why it's want to apply a contraction force equal to that probability of states. Okay? A very practical use. We're going to chat more in the November time frame. A question, please? Can you said B the Boltzmann constant? Yes, it is. So, very good. Any question? If not, then we should uh, wrap up here. So, in the next lecture, let me tell you what we're going to do to wrap up this different conformation. We talk about, think about what we have done so far. Yeah, please. State, possible configuration? Yeah. Um, we will go, go back to this uh, in, the, in the moment. But let's, let's think about, I'm trying to paint a big picture of what we have done so far for the, this chapter. We begin the, the lecture, remember, we talked about why we need to study a very important configuration, chain size. It's relevant to many property, entanglement, et cetera, solution property. And we will go to solution property in the next October very soon. So we start with talking about very simple chain, Gaussian chain, free joint chain, to more realistic uh, uh, f uh, free uh, f uh, free rotation chain and to hinder rotation chain, right? Those, those are still quite quite simple model. So up to now, we also talk about distribution, but it doesn't address one limitation is what happened to the real chain versus idealized chain? Real chain adopt a configuration called uh, um, self-avoiding work. I think I mentioned this work words a couple times. The polymer coil need to avoid itself while it's walking around. And this is something we haven't covered so far. We talk about you know persistence lens, quantify the conformation. But all the context we discussed for to now is an idealized chain. It, it doesn't mean it's not useful. We talk about it's still useful to discuss in a work of polymer melts, where polymer adopt a Gaussian chain, or in Seda solvent. But in a common solvent, we're going to talk about why your polymer is expanded slightly and how we can understand this expansion. That's relevant to a, a concept called scale concept. And we're going to talk about a very simple scale concept. And this is developed and uh, perfect by 
two person, um, um, Sir Edward and um, Dora Edward, they talk about this and they had a nice textbooks on this as well. As well as uh, a very famous polymer physicist, Dijin. He is, uh, he is from France and he won the, another Nobel Prize in polymer physics. As you can see, he's pretty smart and very creative in his research. So in that regard, he introduced a very simple concept. To understand different flexibility, solvent quality, we may not need to measure RG. We may not need to measure end-to-end -end distance. Your materials property can be simply understand how your structure depends on molecular weight. And I'll, I'll explain more. What that means, how your structure or size scale of a coil depends on your molecular weight can be scaled, right? So if your molecular weight doubles, how big your coil is increased. It's a very important concept to understand the materials, property, solvent and quality, et cetera. So that called scale concepts. We still have some time. Um, I'll, I'll talk just a little bit more on that scale concept. So if I double my lens, my weight will be, um, quadrupled, right? Because I scale with three times of my lens and spherical structure. If I have a thin rod, if I double the lens, my rods will double its mass just because the rod is one dimensional structure. So scaling concept basically can help us visualize what's the What's the packing density? What's the scale relationship between our polymer coil without a known common object? So he basically eluded the conclusion. Um, let me find the eraser right here. The scale concept basically says if you find a polymer molecular, uh, the RG is something we can measure, right? This is DRS. You can measure different uh, molecular weight as, as I explained, you can synthesize them and make them. You measure one molecular weight, you plot the RG. You can get this scaling relationship. Scaling means RG is proportional to molecular weight of a power factor of, let's call it alpha. If you plot then log Rg, it will be proportional to alpha multiplied by log molecular weight, right? This now becomes the slope. So you plot log molecular weight versus log Rg. So he basically says, Think about in the idealize the chain. Um, Rg will be scale of molecular weight of power of 0 0.5. That's a scaling relationship or the scale concept. That means that every time you double the molecular weight, Rg only increased by root square 2 when molecular weights uh, doubles. And a lot of time when people measure in good solvents, we found Rg is in realistically scale with 0 0.06 or, or 5 thirds, OK? They will give you the same amount. So in the scaling relationship, we can basically see how this scale, Rg scale with molecular weight. And this has a huge, a huge importance because this helps you to visualize how big the size structure is. And we can also see, let's give you other example. In theta solvents, this will again go with there 
in polymer melt. So this, let me write, good solvent. This is what we see, OK? It melts Rg, we explain. This will be, again, 1 and a half. Same as here. Let me write uniformly as 0 0.5. So in melt, it's also adopt this idealized chain conformation in the same. Or in sodium solvent. One other extreme case in the scaling concept, you can also visualize what Rg. You can again measure a polymer in a bad solvent. Bad solvent, we know your polymer gonna collapse from a Gaussian coil to a basically a dense coil, right? A dense globular of polymer. Assuming it's uniform density, so how does Rg dependence on molecular weight? I'll leave this as something for everybody to think about. I'll, I'll tell everybody what the value is, but it will not be this and not be this, but it will be a unique number somewhere. The hint is you just need to know radius of gyration increase is molecular weight. Molecular weight is relevant to the mass, right? So this is relevant to the how heavy your ball is. How heavy your ball is with dependence of the radius of the ball. That's the hint for everybody, OK? So with that, I'm going to wrap up today's part. And um, this Thursday, we're going to Every, everybody, please hand in the homework. I'll start to grade those. In the Thursday, I'll chat a little bit more on those uh, chain confirmation concepts. And uh, I think we can give more detailed explanation about scaling concepts and this. Uh, I think five o'clock you said that we could turn it in on the 26th. Is that still OK? Yeah, that's still fine if you guys don't have enough time. Okay. I'm good either way. OK? Thanks. Yeah. Any other question? If not, then let's finish today's class, okay?